All right, go ahead and uh, flip to slide two. Well, okay, so it's always good to start off with the definition of what we're going to talk about. And uh, as Kirk mentioned, the title of this is Cross Field Mechanics. It's a standard procedure at the upper levels of uh, football, and it's not very well known or, or utilized that much at the high school level. And uh, hopefully we'll get you guys to understand this and uh, spread the word on what this does and uh, how it works. So the definition is it's a procedure in which the wing official looks across the field to get forward progress. So what we're used to is the near guy, the wing that can see the ball is the one that gets forward progress. And that probably uh, works 98, 99% of the time. But there are certain plays where it doesn't make sense for the near guy uh, to get the progress spot because he has higher priorities. And I'll explain what those are. And when he does have those higher priorities, he relies on his partner on the other side of the field to get the forward progress spot for him. So go ahead and flip. So as I said, it allows the near wing to focus on higher priorities. And the higher priorities are primarily the two things I've listed there. Uh, was a catch made? Now that won't apply all the time because it may not be a pass play. Cross field mechanics can also be useful on running plays. And I will explain that when we get to it. And then the second priority that uh, is higher uh, than the uh, progress spot is dead ball officiating. You know, it doesn't make sense whether we get uh, within six inches of the correct progress spot on a 15 yard gain and then miss a personal foul. So in order, if applicable, the priorities are a catch, dead ball officiating, and then the progress spot. So you can go ahead and flip. George, I, I think um, a great emphasis on that first one, that catch question. I can see what, how a wing that is focused on the progress spot will completely let, let down his focus on whether it's a catch or not. And that, that bobbling of the ball and then it ultimately hits the ground or it's dropped out of bounds or something like that. I think that's, we're just asking a wing official to do two things he can't do at the same time if we expect him to get that spot and the catch. So I, I like that as your, uh, as your primary focus there. Okay. So on our next slide, I have examples of plays that are ideal for cross field mechanics. As I mentioned, one is a pass, uh, a button hook pattern, or any comeback pattern where the receiver is returning towards the passer when the ball is touched. Uh, we have to understand what the progress spot is there, and it's where he's touched after he has control of the ball. But then we also have to make sure that he's not bobbling it as he's going back. And if he, is, if he goes to the ground or is taken to the ground, that he maintains possession of the ball when he contacts the ground. That is completing the sequence of making a catch. And if the wing official is frozen up at the forward progress spot and staring at the ground at his wonderful progress spot, he is going to miss all that. And as I said before, it doesn't have to be a pass play. It can be a running play where the runner is driven backwards, just like an airborne receiver is caught in the air and driven backwards. Doesn't matter whether it was a catch or a run. The key is, is when the guy with the ball is being driven backwards, the near wing official has higher priorities than the progress spot. So go ahead and flip. And now we get into the specific procedure. The first one is totally optional. Uh, the wind the clock signal. The wind the clock signal was not designed to trigger cross field mechanics. 
And that's why I say it's optional. But by winding his arm in the air, he is signaling to his partner across the field, get my progress spot for me. It should not be necessary. In a uh, coordinated crew where the wings know each other backwards and forward, the far wing should recognize the play and know when to get the progress spot. But if you need the Band-Aid, you can use the wind the clock signal as the Band-Aid. And that's all I'm going to say that, that about that. Uh, you, I don't think you will see that in any of the videos. So the next step, again, is if applicable, if it's a pass play, is for the near wing to determine if the catch is made. And then he watches the dead ball action. And then finally, he goes back up to the progress spot that his partner has marked, and he mirrors it. So that's the procedure for the covering or near official. Our next slide has the procedure for the far wing. Okay? And very simply, he is to get the progress spot. He then pinches in to demonstrate that he has the progress spot. And like many things in this sequence, that's conditional because depending on what kind of play it was, he may have his own dead ball activity that he has to watch. So again, the pinching in is, is optional. Uh, it's, it's preferable. And then the key is the last one is he has to communicate, especially to the umpire, that he has a good progress spot. And there's nothing wrong with him saying that loud enough so that it can be heard across the field. Okay, and then the last slide before we get to the video is the perennial what if, and then what if none of this happens, and the near official uh, has done what he's supposed to do, but the far official has not reacted for whatever reason. And then you have to approximate the progress spot, or in other words, fake it. We can't publish fake it, but that may very well be what you have to do. And hopefully uh, the spot won't be within inches of the line to gain. And, and keep in mind uh, one of the basic principles uh, of, the, uh, of getting the progress spot is the, the longer the play goes and the furthest it is beyond the line to gain, the less important it is to get the exact spot. If you give a runner 39 yards on a 49, uh, 40 yard gain, nobody's going to care and probably nobody's going to notice. But if you miss six inches and you've got them short of the line to gain when he earned a first down, then the six inches is very, very important. So I think Let's stop there, if we can, Kurt, before we go to the video and ask if anybody has any questions on what I've covered uh, before we look at the video. All right. You guys are welcome to use the chat if there's anything you want to comment on or ask. But since our numbers are, are fairly low, I think uh, you're certainly welcome to speak up and ask, ask a question as we go. I thought that was very thorough, George. Any questions? I got a question. We... You got go a ahead. Question? Please. So you, you may cover this in the plays, but my last two years, I've always wondered how the, the opposite wing, if, if you got a player going out of bounds, whether it's a runner or after a catch, how is the opposite wing determining that progress if the near wing isn't? Is there a signal that, that you guys use that the near wing says, okay, take my, take my position now, or is the opposite wing just kind of winging it? where that guy crosses that far sideline? It's a good question, George. You want to take that one? Yeah. Uh, we're not talking about out-of-bounds plays. If it's an out-of-bounds play, then the wing official uh, has to remember the, the spot uh, and do his dead ball officiating. Uh, obviously, if the play has gone out-of-bounds, 
He's already figured out whether it's a catch or not, so that won't be an issue. So he's got to do his dead ball officiating, and he'll be able to get help on the dead ball officiating uh, from either the back judge or the referee if it's on the uh, – uh, depending on what side of the field it's on. Uh, but you, you said it. It's, uh, it's impossible for a guy on the opposite sideline to get an out-of-bounds spot. And that is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about plays where the guy with the ball gets driven backwards. And if he gets driven backwards and out of bounds, the forward progress spot is where he was contacted and started getting driven backwards. So the exact spot that he ends up crossing the sideline is irrelevant. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I think, yes, George, thanks. I think I probably jumped ahead and didn't realize you guys were not talking about specific out of bounds uh, spots. Thanks, though. So, so Jerry, I, George used a lot of words. My, my answer would have been if that play, if that runner goes out of bounds and the forward progress is the intersection of the ball and the sideline, the, for, the far official has, has no support. That's all you. We're only tonight is the cross field mechanic only comes into play when there's a forward progress ruled inbounds and driven back, not where the ball crosses the sideline. That that to me, I mean, sure you can call it winging it, but the the wing that sees that intersection of the ball on the sideline and then watches the catch be made or completed is all on that near wing. So, okay, yeah, I, I my mistake, I was misinterpreting the scenario. Any other questions before we jump into some plays? Good question, though. All right, George, I've got the uh, the first play up. Okay, so we're we're in uh, we're in Denver now. Before we move to more exotic uh, locales, uh, and uh, go ahead and uh, run the play, and we'll notice that it is a uh, is a catch, and cross field mechanics are not used, but at least. The near wing has the sense to watch the action uh, after the catch. So this would be maybe a C on this play. Uh, Kirk's going to stop it and show you uh, where he should have stopped. He doesn't need to run all the way back and get in the middle of the play, but he can hold his ground right there. I think we're in a good position, right? There. Good and position here to see a catch. Catch, no yeah. catch. And we kind of give up on it. Okay. Well, George, you like you like him stopping about right here because he can see the action of the catch. The forward progress is supported right. by your wing, your cross yeah, field. There's field. no reason for him to go up to the progress spot. The progress spot belong on this play belongs to the far wing. Now, can he make a mental note that it's one or two yards past uh, a five-yard line uh, as an approximation if he needs it? Certainly. But he goes up to the spot, and then he stays there. Uh, the play is not that far away, so this is not – you know, egregious mechanics, but it's not cross field mechanics. I'm going to call it a knicker mechanics because we've got the wing coming in and there's no need to bring that spot into the field of play. He could have, at a minimum, he should have stayed wide because you can get that spot from the sideline. You don't need to come crashing in. How do you like that knicker mechanics? That's before we had the mechanics manual. Okay. Okay. Oh, we didn't, uh, we didn't talk, George. You didn't identify. If you want to uh, look at a play again or you have a question on the play, you need to buzz Kirk because we're just going to uh, move on. Uh, I've got seven plays to cover, and then Kirk has, uh, I think, another two plays that are really right. straight up. George, you didn't identify the quarterback here. Yeah, the, uh, the quarterback is uh, Jack Elway uh, at Cherry, when he was at Cherry Creek. And, of course, uh, he went to uh, Arizona State. 
and gave up football in his sophomore year. Okay, so now we, uh, we go to a more exotic scenario here, the Aloha Bowl. Uh, we have a private school versus a public school. And uh, one of the things we're going to do uh, when we're done is we're going to get a pronunciation to give you a pronunciation test on all the Hawaii school names. Campbell. Uh, <laughs> but uh, on this play, uh, there's a 10 yard pushback. Uh, and that looks like they managed to get a good progress spot. Again, though, the near wing is holding the progress spot instead of moving to observe the dead ball action. It's hard to tell from looking at the video whether he can see everything that he needs to see or whether he needed to move. But the point is, is he could have moved and he didn't move. So they got the progress spot. Uh, and sometimes you can use the wrong mechanics and still get the play 100% correct. But when you don't use the right mechanics, eventually things will catch up with you. So with that, uh, let's uh, move on to play three. I was going to see, George, if our top, can we see if our top wing doesn't look like he's, at this point, of the catch is providing much service as a crossfield mechanics, but he may have ultimately got to, got to where he needed to be. This near official, I like his focus on the catch, though. That's what we're looking for. You can see the brim of his hat focused on the, the action of the tacklers, control of the ball. I, I like, I like his, uh, his movements there. Okay, no, no Campbell to pronounce here. Uh, so on this play, uh, the play is complicated because there is extracurricular activity but apparently it is away uh, from where the ball is. Uh, and, of course, the near wing uh, makes a mistake. Before we get into the referee, why don't you just back up and let's uh, watch that the near wing doesn't understand that the progress spot is inbounds on this. That was very, very choppy. But that play ended in bounds, and then the, they ended up out of bounds. So he stopped the clock erroneously. As it turned out, it was a correct clock stopping because there was a uh, personal foul away from the ball, which the near wing had no idea of. I believe the foul was called by the umpire. And this is the one that we want to uh, turn the audio on and listen to the referee's announcement. Is able to hang on. This will be his third catch of the year. We have dead ball offsetting fouls. Number six and excuse me. We have dead ball offsetting fouls. Don't remain the same. Okay, so if we can get away from uh, the cross field mechanics and talk about the referee's announcement. Uh, that's very, very weak. He gave no signaling. He didn't identify the players. He didn't say what the dead ball fouls were. A very, very slipshod announcement. We got a wing here that kind of tuck tails and runs. I think uh, just, just looking at this mechanic from the beginning, he's, he's right up on the sideline. We talk about giving yourself some room. There's no reason to be right up here on the sideline on any play. And then he, by the time this action starts to starts to get in his feet, his legs, he's got to actually turn his body and run away from it, which is it's never a good never a good look. So if we were wider and took a forty five degree angle backwards, we might do better at uh, at not having to turn our shoulders away from this action. Okay, so play four is uh, kind of a unique scenario and. It's what I would call half cross-field mechanics. So initially, there are no cross-field mechanics used. The uh, near wing knows to uh, 
keep the clock running. He doesn't get the correct forward progress spot. But his partner does. And they get, for the next play, they corrected it upon word of the far wing. So the far wing was astute enough to get the correct progress spot, but he didn't know to communicate and to get the ball spotted correctly. Now, I did. Uh, I presented this to a luncheon group about a month ago, and when I said the words that I just said, uh, I got the argument that uh, maybe they marked the uh, progress spot, maybe the wing did mark the progress spot correctly, and the umpire ignored them. So, of course, all the umpires in the audience booed at that comment. Uh, so again, we you know we really don't know what transpired, but we know that the near wing does not understand progress. He got the wrong spot, but somebody on the crew helped the crew get it right in the end. George, one comment that I've had in talking about crossfield mechanics is the importance of pregame and developing that trust with your opposite wing. If you haven't developed that trust that your opposing wing is going to be there, you're very vulnerable in giving up what we're asking this near wing to give up and focus on the out-of-bound spot and then look up and not have any support from across the field. And now all of a sudden you're making something up and it may or may not be a game changer, but um, I guess the importance of communicating pregame and getting to work with your uh, opposite wing is, is key here. Yeah, you just made the uh, argument for uh, one of the arguments for working in crews. Because let's let us be honest here: uh, if you're working with a guy you've never worked with before, you you got bigger issues than cross field mechanics. You are not going to get cross field mechanics done the first time you work with somebody. Right. Okay. Next play. Okay. The next play. Uh, on this one, the uh, the line judge ignores the players, and he goes, turns his back to them, and just goes to get the progress spot. Now I don't think he missed anything, but he has no clue what the guy with the ball is uh, is doing. So, uh, what grade are we going to give this wing on this one? Uh, I think that's D well, material. We give him something because he got the progress spot, so I give him a D. Yeah, but the, let's say the receiver didn't catch the ball. Well, he, has no, F. he has no idea. If the receiver throws the ball at the defender, he gets an F. If the defender gives the receiver a shot as they're getting up, he gets an F. So you would agree that at this point about – let me stop this right, right here – Probably should have just stayed put, if anything, may have backed up 45 degrees off the sideline to watch this ball move in his hand and get a good spot or uh, get a good look at the end of the play. And then about right now, take a pink up at your opposite wing, move towards that spot, making sure they get up off the ground. Nobody throws the ball at anybody. I think we also have to keep in mind that the umpire and the referee's eyes are certainly in this direction if they're not cleaning up something else. So you're not all by yourself in looking at the dead ball action. Certainly language is going to be harder to hear from the umpire and the referee. Uh, but I, I don't like this. He kills the clock. I wonder if it's a, uh, it's a line to gain. I don't It's second and four. So, yeah. so they may have come pretty close to the – yeah, he did get the first down, so that's why he shut down the clock. Yeah, so I'd like to second your comments about the umpire, but this is a right-handed quarterback, and look where the referee is. Yeah, the referee is going to be of minimal use on this play uh, because of his distance, and he's probably going to be block blocked out by intervening players. Hey, Kirk. Yes, Jerry, go ahead. Can Would you mind going into a little more detail exactly where you would like to see him moving? Uh, I, I got the maybe going back a little bit to see the end of the play, but then from there, can you can you uh, expand a little bit? 
So we're snapping at the 22 just to give a relative location. So I, I would expect him about in the right position right here. He didn't move far off the line of scrimmage. He's got an out route. You know, if, if he would have run down field five yards, he'd have been right on top of this play. So I, I like the, the speed of his movement at the line of scrimmage on the pass. So at this point, he's pretty close to where he started. His eyes are still. And at this point, as this action is now coming back to him, again, there's no reason to stay solid if, if you're if you're going to sense trouble into your body i would i would want to see him taking that 45 degree angle backwards off the sideline away from this action just back back up at this angle 45 off the sideline and watch the watch the ball to make sure it's caught yeah i, I totally get that but from if he was backed up now now what he, he uh, so right now I, let's say he's standing about right here. He, he senses that that ball was caught. Hopefully he can see enough. At that point in time, his eyes are still somewhat engaged in what's going on, but he takes a, le a look across the field to his fellow official and then moves up the line of scrimmage, looking across and setting his feet, standing on the sideline at that spot. Still probably looking back at this action. Okay, thank you. As, they, as the players come up off the ground and – aren't talking smack or throwing the ball at each other. Does that help? Yes, thank you. I, I was curious what you kind of wanted as far as movement after they after the players landed on the ground. Yeah, I can see him just rotating right now with his eyes still on the players. He knows that there's a progress spot up here somewhere. And as George mentioned earlier, if this line to gain is achieved, plus or minus a yard is not going to be critical. So in his mind, if he knows it was a four-yard – to the uh, line to gain and they made six or it felt like six yards again the urgency and the accuracy is not the, the critical piece okay uh my penultimate play uh my notes here indicate the line judge misses the forward progress uh, progress spot he stops the clock erroneously and he uses sloppy signals so let's look for all three things and the progress spots the 38, and he goes over to the 42. So he's got a four yard miss. Uh, I don't know where the line, it doesn't show the down and distance, does it? Nope. So another thing here, George, to talk about to go a little deeper. You give him that second effort instead of the first. Because you got a forward progress spot right here. You give him this effort to the sideline. Do you rule this out of bounds or do you keep the clock running? No, the progress uh, got stopped uh, at the 38 when he got driven back. He never broke free. Once he got pushed back, he was never able to advance. See, he's in control there, and that's what the line judge didn't understand. That play, the progress, the play ends right there. This play is over. Does the game situation, late fourth quarter, 28-25, team losing with the ball, he's trying to get out of bounds, make a difference here for you? Yeah, it makes a difference. you got to get it right. You can't give a team an advantage. So the defense stopped the guy inbounds earn the right to run time off the clock by keeping it running. And you can't change that and give the offense an undeserved advantage of stopping the clock when they didn't earn it. So your, your justification in that statement is primarily because progress was stopped inbounds and the runner was never free to have a second effort to gain yardage. Yeah, if, he, if he'd have been knocked so, backwards and not actually controlled right here with his leg, and it now, if he gets his uh, gets his leg loose and is able to take a step or two forward, then he's erased the original progress spot, but he's never been able to break free. I think this brings up consistency as well. If this was six minutes left in the second quarter, we're running the clock. One forty nine late in the fourth of a close game, we're running the clock. <laughs> Always. When in doubt, run the clock. 
Okay, did you move on to the last one? I did. This is plate seven, George. Okay, so on this one, the uh, oh, line. Oh, by the, the way, this is this is bald player, and he marks the spot. So the coach saw the dead ball foul. But the linesman was too busy holding his spot to miss that. I don't see a foul. That's football. No. That extra shove. That's renewed effort. That's good defense. No. I like defensive football. Maybe there was a little bit of a push. Just because the coaches are whiny, though, makes me want to not throw it. It would help to know if we had a whistle as well. We're focused on uh, crossfield mechanics, so that doesn't really help us there, does it? So, George, let's talk. So, our, our far wing good position here. Getting out of the way. As long as he's watching this action, I think we're okay. It's just hard to tell if he was uh, – looking at it or not. All right, I've got a couple more plays. You got anything else on this one, George? No, go ahead and do your two plays. All right, I've got a couple plays and then we'll call it night. Let's see, how do I get back? Uh, when you get a chance, send me your two plays so I'll add them in case I do this again for somebody. Okay. All right, so we're looking at dark teams and offense. And the uh, annotations will stop the play for what we're focused on. So we're looking at a pass play to the receiver that's circled, and he'll have uh, a progress spot and then get driven back, I believe. So we're looking at the near official. So I've got the, the far official circled here, and, and my, my message here is, you know, we talk about the cross field mechanics, and it's really about vantage point. Because of the angle from that far side, and maybe this, maybe my uh, arrow doesn't, doesn't help you, but the idea was that the view angle from that position, so our wing is right there, when he's looking this way, he has a much better chance of an idea of the forward progress spot than this wing back here does, and it's all because of angles. So now we'll play it through and look where the near near official is. He's what? Oh, I guess we've got another circle. Now our far wing official has moved up to the forward progress spot, but he didn't get there. So the arrow is where he should be. So we're not proper cross field mechanics because we stopped at this spot instead of getting all the way to the progress spot downfield. And I'll uh, I'll turn off annotations and you guys can watch it all play out. But the spot was left far short of uh, where it should have been. Let me turn off these annotations and let it run. So we're keeping an eye on the far official and the actual line to gain or the actual forward progress spot here. Catch it about the 46. And we come up and we really have no idea where that uh, forward progress spot should have been. And I hang that on that, uh, that far official for not being where he needs to be. Now, as an umpire, I, I would appreciate not only do I want that, that far official to be at the forward progress spot, I'd like to hear from him. If we're not lining that ball up where that should be, I don't know if he's stopping the clock up here because it's achieved the line gain. may very well be. But I like to hear, hey, I got the forward progress spot up here, up here. If you do have it and you're not getting the attention you need to have the rest of the crew. George, you got anything else to add on this? No. I don't think we get anything out of that end zone on this particular. Okay, the second play. Also a pass play, third and six. You can see at the top of the screen, third down and about six. Throw to the flats. Again, I'm showing that, that view angle from this cross field mechanic near official. 
where we can help both with a forward progress spot right at the line to gain. Now I imagine George, this let's just say that this wing at the top, he, he comes in pretty confident with his spot at the end of the play, um, because well, one and he has the actual line to gain stake there. I actually think this looks very confident in the spot, but again, he has no idea if that ball actually fell out of the receiver's hand out of bounds. So I guess I would like to see him rotate his eyes right here into the action, probably move his body into the field of play to get a little distance to look at the ball. And then that bar official, I think he comes into the into the hash on this new hash with a solid spot and probably vocal to say I've got the I've got the forward progress spot right here. Yeah, so what I would add to what you said is this is not a uh, first down. He catches the ball beyond the line to gain right there. And he gets his feet down right at the stake. But we got to remember that the line to gain is not a plane like the goal line. Once you get the ball over the goal line, you have a touchdown and the ball is dead. In this case, uh, you don't have a first down and the ball is not dead, and he is coming back on his own, and right there is the progress spot. As soon as that defender puts his hand on 84's back, that's the progress spot, and that is behind the line to gain. Now, you may say, you know, what, what's the significance of him touching his back and uh, the best answer I can give you there is there has to be a quantitative criteria for determining the forward progress spot. So the way the rule is written and the interpretation is when a player is retreating of his own volition, the progress spot is where he is first touched. But totally different if that was the goal line. Correct. Good, good breakdown on this play. So then if that's no, the that's case, a great, that's a great play. No doubt, short of the first or the uh, line to gain. Well, it, it's still pretty close. Is the line to gain on the, yeah, it's on the 40. So definitely short if you're using uh, the proper rule interpretation there. Okay, I think that's all the plays that we wanted to show. We're going to finish up early, but I want to... Uh, Give an opportunity. Anybody got any questions on, uh, on what's been said? Good stuff tonight. Um, seeing none, I think we'll uh, we'll call it an evening. George, great job. Great uh, great batch of plays. So thank you, and thanks for the extra plays. You bet. I'll get them shipped off to you. All right. Have a good night, y'all. Next week, we're uh, I'm going to try to get our uh, our friend from uh, San Diego. Uh, uh, area director out in uh, San Diego that I want to see if he can talk through their work as a site as a uh, as an official at halftime. So if you join us next week, I'm hoping to have his uh, breakdown of how they work on uh, field issues during the halftime break. So thanks all. Have a good night. Stay safe.